Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Isn't it good to have a place where we can come at least once a week and uh, be encouraged to know that uh, his kingdom is near and our hope is in him. We need that because I'm sure I don't have to tell you, we are living in a big, old, scary world. And if you're a parent, this world is bigger and scarier than ever. In fact, I would go so far as to say it's bigger and scarier for parents than it is for kids because so often kids don't know what they don't know, but we do know. And that can be an incredible burden to bear. I mean, we can't live their lives for them and we can't be with them every minute of the day to protect them. So what are we to do? Well, we're to do what Christ followers have done for 2000 years. We put our hope in God. We put our hope in God because he has not abandoned us. He has not forsaken us. He has not left us to our own devices. No, he has given us his written word, the Bible, that instructs us and trains us on being parents and being kids and being any other kind of person in the world. He's given us his son, Jesus Christ, the living word who has promised to be with us always, who has told us in John 16, 33, Be of good cheer, for I have overcome this big, scary world. In the next couple of weeks, Pastor Ken and I want to talk to you about setting our kids up for success. Now, contrary to popular opinion, we don't primarily set our kids up for success by getting them a quality education. We don't set them up for success by making sure they're financially secure. We don't do it by making sure they know all of the right people. Nothing's wrong with any of these things, and they certainly have their place. But the Bible points out something that is much more important, much more essential, if we're going to set our children up for success. The most important gift, biblically speaking, that we can give to our children is to make them wise. And the way we do that is we discipline them and we disciple them. We discipline our children by bringing them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. We teach them the truths of God's word. We model for them the truths of God's word. We help them learn how to live out those truths in everyday life. We disciple them by introducing them to Jesus Amen. and cultivating that relationship. It's through disciplining and discipling that they become wise. And the, the two really are inseparable. They go together. Because the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that Jesus is the power of God. He is the wisdom of God. He wasn't just a wise man. He didn't just have some wise things to say. No, Jesus is the very essence of wisdom. And so we've got to have that relationship with him, that discipling relationship with him. And next week, Pastor Ken is going to talk to us about how we can help our children move down that road, come to know Jesus as their Lord and their Savior, and then grow as his disciples. Today, though, we're going to talk about discipline. How can we administer discipline in such a way that the end result is a wise child, a child that is thoroughly prepared and equipped to move in to this big scary world and do so with the hope and the knowledge that our God is with us and he's given us his word. Before we jump into all of that though, let's, uh, let's take a minute and pray together. Father, we do say thank you for giving us your church. Thank you for giving us a place where we can come together as brothers and sisters in Christ 
where we can lift up our voices to sing praise to your son Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for a place where we can come and be encouraged and taught, where we can show love to one another and find forgiveness and find hope in a world that seems to be running off of the rails. Thank you, Lord, for Faith Bridge and for what it means to us, what it means to this community and to the world. And I pray, Lord, that as we've gathered now for this time of worship and this time of looking at your word, your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's just be honest here right up front. Administering discipline is an onerous chore. I don't know any parent that likes disciplining their kids, that enjoys it. If you do, we might need to talk a little bit at the end of the service. I mean, it's not fun for anybody. It's not fun for the parent. It's not fun for the kid. And yet, the Bible operates on the assumption that we will. The Bible teaches that a primary responsibility of a parent is to discipline their children. But if it is so onerous and is so not fun for anyone involved, why is the Bible adamant that we do it? Why does the Bible say in Ephesians chapter 6, fathers, do not exasperate your children but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Why does the Bible say in the book of Proverbs that the person who fails to discipline their child hates their child, but the one who loves their child will be careful to discipline that child? Why does the Bible take this approach? Because the Bible teaches that discipline is the means by which we make our children wise. It's the tool that God has given to us. It's the means by which we impart wisdom. We train them, we bring them up, we prepare and equip them for a world that if you're gonna live successfully, you've got to have wisdom. The Bible teaches us that wisdom actually is the greatest gift we could ever give to our children. In Proverbs chapter 3, beginning at verse 13, the writer says this, Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. Nothing you desire can compare to wisdom. That is an astonishing statement. There's nothing you can think of that will be more valuable to your life than wisdom. No amount of money, fame, power, prestige, you fill in the blank, whatever it is your mind can come up with, the Bible is clear that nothing compares to wisdom. It's the greatest gift that we can impart to our children. But what is this thing? anyway, called wisdom. What does the Bible mean, anyhow, when it talks about wisdom? Well, the best definition I've come across, uh, I found in the dusty pages of an old commentary written by a German Old Testament scholar. Very concise, helpful definition. Wisdom is competence with regard to the realities of life. Competence with regard to the realities of life. I like that because it gets right to the nub of the issue. Life is hard. Life is challenging. And if we're going to be anywhere near successful, if we're going to be anywhere near living the kind of life that is pleasing to God and a blessing to others and fulfilling to ourselves, it's going to require wisdom. That's the gift that God has given to us. 
in order to navigate this world. The gift of wisdom. Having wisdom, of course, doesn't guarantee that life is going to be perfect. No, it does not protect us from sin and from suffering. We live in a broken world. We live in a world that is fallen. And many times things happen to us that are completely beyond our control. But to the degree to which we have a choice in the matter. Wisdom is our best friend. Wisdom helps us navigate life. It helps us understand the difference between right and wrong, good choices and bad choices, knowing what to do in a given situation. There's no greater gift that we can impart to our children than this beautiful thing called wisdom. And the means by which we give them this wisdom is through discipline. Discipline. It is the unique responsibility of every parent. We can't farm it out to anybody else. And it's sure not going to grow all on its own. Before I go further, maybe I should uh, clarify, differentiate between punishment and discipline because the two are often used synonymously. Punishment is much more narrow in its scope than discipline. Punishment typically is addressing a single issue, and the goal there is to change the behavior, to control the behavior. Obedience, and that's it. Now, whether the child learns anything or not, that's not the issue when it comes to punishment. It's just getting you to do what I want you to do. Discipline, on the other hand, is much more broad in its scope. It includes training and instruction. There is a goal. You're moving towards something. You're helping your child to become wise. Now, punishment may be an aspect of discipline. But discipline is a much broader endeavor. Something that's going to require a lot more effort on our part than simply issuing punishment. Yeah, we've got to do it. We can't give it to anybody else. And as I said, uh, wisdom does not grow up naturally all on its own. That's why the Bible says a child's heart is bound up in folly. And we use discipline in order to drive that folly out. Folly is a word for foolish behavior. And children are born foolish. They don't understand what is best. And our job is to drive that folly out. When the Bible says that they are bound up in folly, the, the image is of one who's wrapped in a rope of folly. They really don't have any choice coming into this world. And our job is to cut those bonds of foolishness and set them up to be wise. A toddler does not understand that you don't touch a hot stove, and so you discipline them. You help them understand that will not produce the desired results. And as they grow up, you continue to administer discipline because there is a seemingly endless supply of foolishness there. We have to stay on top of them. We have to be about this onerous, difficult chore because it doesn't just go away on its own. We've got to teach them all through their growing up years. In fact, the older they get, the more serious it becomes. Far more serious than a burned hand. Son, there is a reason you do not fill your car full of your friends and drive 90 miles an hour down to I-45. Daughter, there is a reason you do not take compromising pictures of yourself and send them to your boyfriend. Wisdom is the most beautiful gift that we can give to our children. And we give it to them through discipline. This morning I want to talk to you about three means, three guidelines, if you will, of discipline. Three very broad principles related to the task of discipline. Now, in case you're wondering, I am not going to get into technique. I'm not going to talk about spanking. I'm not going to talk about taking away privileges or timeouts. You can figure that out in your own home. What I'm going to talk about are three very broad 
guidelines or principles of discipline that can apply to any home, any situation, whether you've got boys or girls, whether you've got one or ten. No matter what's going on in your house, these principles are applicable across the board to every single individual who is a parent. And the first of those is that we should administer discipline confidently. Confidently. As a parent, God's word is clear that you have been given the responsibility and the authority to discipline your child. You don't have to apologize for being the disciplinarian in your home. As the book of Proverbs says, it's an act of love. It's not just about responsibility and authority. It's a way of showing love to our children, to discipline them. The one who hates his or her child fails to discipline, but the one who loves that child will administer discipline carefully. There's this myth that sort of floats around out there that really the most loving thing that we can do for our children is to remove all discomfort and to set them up for a life of ease. But friends, nothing could be further from the truth. Sometimes the most loving thing that we can do is to administer some strategic pain in their lives. Because pain and discomfort can be an amazing teacher. And the fact of the matter is, pain and discomfort are going to be a part of our lives our whole life long. Oh, we may try in vain to shield and protect them during these years, but there's going to come a day when they're out of the nest. Will they be ready? Or will they have been so shielded that they're unable? Several years ago, a couple came to see me with their son. And this boy, the only way to put it, I mean, he was bristling with anger. It didn't take five minutes for me to discern who was in charge in this house. He was confidently angry, let's say. He was confident because he knew that he was in charge. And he knew that his parents were afraid of him. Well, after about 10 minutes in his presence, my confidence level began to rise quite a bit. I was feeling rather confident about administering some discipline. And so I invited him to leave and let me just talk to mom and dad for a while. So he left the room. And I began to talk to mom and dad. And it didn't take long to figure out exactly what they were afraid of. I asked them about, you know, how how do you discipline your son. And the answer was rather startling. It revealed to me that um, obviously they were not afraid physically of their son. They were twice his size. They could easily take him. (laughs) They were afraid of losing his friendship. I asked, how do you discipline him? And the mom said, well, We don't know what to do because we're just afraid that if we do, he won't like us. They could hardly believe it when I said, "Um, I'm afraid you have already accomplished that objective. He does not like you. (laughs) He does not like you one little bit. Worse than that, he does not respect you. You see, here's the truth of the matter. Whether you choose to discipline your child or not, there's going to come a day When he or she does not like you. That's part of the package. The difference is this. If you fail to discipline your child, that dislike is going to ultimately become contempt. Because they are going to discern. They may not be able to think about it consciously, but deep down in their heart, they're going to know, I've been cheated. My parents failed to give me something that I needed in order to be a well-rounded, successful adult, and they're going to be contemptuous of you. On the other hand, if you do choose to discipline your child, they're not going to like it any more than the other kid, but that dislike is ultimately going to lead to appreciation. As they grow older, they're going to be able to look back and see, they did that because they loved me. They did that because they wanted to equip me and prepare me for what was next. Friends, moms and dads, 
Parenting is not a popularity contest. It is not your job to be your child's friend. It's your job to be their parent and to parent them in such a way so that when they are adults, they will want to be your friend. We're setting our children up for wisdom. And we do that by disciplining them. And one of the ways we discipline them is confidently. A second guiding principle is that we should administer discipline consistently. And we do that in two ways. The first way is that we clarify the rules of the home and the consequences that are to follow, and then we stick with it. No matter how bothersome it may become, and I'll be the first to admit, it can be bothersome. There are those days you just want to say, whatever. I'm sitting here enjoying this ball game. I'm sitting here doing whatever it is I want to do. Go ahead, kill each other. (laughs) At least it'll be quiet around here for a while. (laughs) That is the overwhelming temptation at times. But it's not doing right by our children. Not by a long shot. Now, Jesus said, um, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be consistent. Because you see, consistency creates security. A child needs to know what is in bounds and what is out of bounds. That will give them a sense of peace, that knowledge that, yes, this is where I can live and all will go well. If I step over this line, it will not go so well with me. There is tremendous stability and security in that knowledge. Last week, Becky and I were having dinner with some friends who told us about um, an experience their daughter had had going to a, a sleepover with one of their friends. And the next day when uh, she came home, she came in the door and said, Mom, Dad, I am so glad we have rules. I was a nervous wreck over there. Never knew what was going to happen next. Be consistent. Make the rules, make the consequences, and stick with it. Love your child enough to give them that sense of confidence that, yeah, if dad said it, he means it. If mom said it, she means it. And it will happen every single time. A second way to be consistent in our disciplining is for mom and dad to be on the same page, to be a united front Not for one of you to be singing one song and the other to be singing something else. If you haven't figured it out, parents, let me clue you in. Children are devious. (laughs) They are constantly looking for the angle, the loopholes, the possibility of exploitation. And if they can figure out, ah, Never get what I want here, but always get what I want here. Guess where they're going to go? One of my clearest memories from childhood, I was about nine or ten years old, and uh, I remember going in our kitchen of our home and asking my mom if I could go swimming with my friends that day. And she said, no. I don't, I don't remember what the reason was that she gave at the time, but the answer was clearly no. No. Well, that wasn't the answer that I wanted. And I was miffed. And I walked out of the back door into the backyard. And suddenly, I had the most original thought that any child has ever thought of in the history of the universe. I'm going to go ask Dad. My dad was working in his shop. So I walked up there and said, hey, I've been invited to go swim. Can I go? Now, nine times out of 10, 99% of the time, he would have said, well, what does your mama say? But for some reason on this particular instance, he did not. I guess he was distracted with what he was doing. And he said, sure, have a good time, be careful. I'm gone. (laughs) Now, why on earth I thought I could get away with that is completely beyond me because my parents never, ever, ever were not in unison when it came to discipline 
and to parenting us. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Coming in the back door and there they stood. (laughs) A united front. The day did not end on a happy note for me. (laughs) Back one another up. Be on the same team. Talk about things. Figure out things ahead of time. Be in agreement. Do that for the good of your child, but do it for the good of one another. And if you happen to disagree about a disciplinary move, talk about it in private. Don't diminish your spouse's authority in front of the child. That's not kind, and that's not helpful. Deal with it behind closed doors, and then come out. Yeah, we're in this together. Whatever mom says, that's what dad says. Whatever dad says, that's what mom says. So we're consistent by establishing the rules and sticking with them. We're consistent by being on the same page. Before I move on to the third guideline of discipline, let me take just a minute to tell you what uh, consistency is not. It is not necessarily disciplining each child in your home the same way. I mean, all of your children need to understand the reality of consequences, but the nature of those consequences needs to vary depending upon the child. No two children are alike, and no two children will respond to the same means of persuasion exactly alike. In my family of origin, there were four boys and one girl. My sister never got a spanking, ever. And just a few years ago, I mean, my my mom and dad are 92 now, but for some reason, two or three years ago, we were talking about this sort of thing, the discipline that went on in our home. And uh, my dad pointed out that my sister never got a spanking. And my brothers and I were reminded of that truth and kind of looked at him like, well, why? He said, she didn't need it. All I had to do was just look at her with disappointment in my voice and on my face, and that was worse than any spanking I could have ever given her. You never tried that strategy with me, you know. (laughs) No, he did not try that strategy with me because he knew better. He knew that I needed other, more convincing kinds of persuasion, (laughs) which is what I usually got. I'm not recommending that technique to anyone. That's just what happened to me. No two homes are just alike. No two kids are just alike. Love your kid enough to get to know them and find out what is going to work for you. You may be blessed with someone like my perfect sister. (laughs) On the other hand... You may be blessed with someone like me. (laughs) Love them enough to find out what's going to work for you. So be confident, be consistent. And third, um, discipline in community. Now, by that, I don't mean you take your child out into the middle of the (laughs) cul-de-sac and administer discipline. No, what... What I'm talking about is this. It is simply the realization that none of us have all the answers. I mean, parenting, you know, it's right up there with marriage, the hardest thing that we will ever do. And none of us have all the answers. And none of us should be ashamed to go and seek help. That's why we, one of the reasons why we have this thing called Faith Bridge. We are here for each other. This is the body of Christ. Becky and I regularly, over the 20 years now that we have been parenting and the 16 or so that we've lived here, we have consulted an older couple. I'm not going to tell you their name because they would be embarrassed, but we have gone to them any number of times because they were further down the road and they had been there and done that and their kids turned out pretty darn good. 
And so we knew they were a great source of wisdom. And I can't tell you how many times we have reached our wit's end, especially as the girls have gotten older, wondering, what do we do now? Uh, We're calling so-and-so. That's what we're doing. And they have blessed us. They have blessed us. Freely, generously. And I shudder to think, What might we have done? What might we not have done had we not had their wisdom? Friends, don't don't fall for the silly trap that says somehow I've got to persuade the world that my kids are perfect. Guess what? We know they're not. (laughs) I don't care how many perfect posts you put on Facebook. We know they are not perfect. Perfect. I'm on Facebook, and you know, I posted one time that something that's gotten more hits than anything else. None of my children did anything spectacular today. I don't think they necessarily liked that post a lot, but... No, seek out people who have been down that road, who are older, wiser, more experienced, and receive the blessing of their wisdom so that you can pass that wisdom on. One of the most beautiful things about the body of Christ is that we have one another. We all have our gifts. We all have our strong points, and we all have our weak points. But as we come together, we tackle the hard things in life, like living for Jesus, like being married, like being a parent, and all the rest. That's why one of the reasons why we emphasize around here, grow groups, being with other people who are in the same boat and learning from one another. You know, if if you're a parent of teenagers you have probably figured out by now just how stupid you are. (laughs) And how incredibly wise every other parent is. Because their kids always get to do this, or they never have to do that. Well, there's a, a, a couple in our grow group who have kids the same age as ours. And you know, every child needs an adult other than mom and dad that they can go to and talk to because there are going to be things that they will talk to uh, talk about with that adult that they're not going to talk about with us and uh, the wife in this couple has proven to be that person for my girls and here I'm going to get choked up again dang it I can't tell you how thankful I am for this woman knowing that there is someone who loves them almost as much as their mom and who's been there so many times for my girls to go and say who knows what, probably how angry we made them. And I know that I can trust her to speak a godly, biblical word of wisdom into their lives that they're going to be able to hear. Because when they come home, they're going to put the earplugs back in and not hear the things that we might say. Don't cheat yourself of those resources. Look for them, find them, take advantage of them. And when you find yourself a little further down the road, be that person for other people and let them know, my door is open. Call me, I'm here because I know what it's like. Yeah, parenting's hard and this is a big, big, scary world. But we've got God on our side. And God has blessed us with the wisdom of his word. And he's blessed us with his son, Jesus, the living word. The wisdom of God. I thought it might be appropriate on this, the first Sunday of of summer, for us to... um, prayerfully recommit ourselves 
to being not just the moms and dads, but the men and women, the grandparents, the friends that our kids need them to be. Uh, You may not be a parent here, or maybe your parenting days are, are long behind you, but that doesn't mean you don't have a voice, you don't have a role to play in the life of our young people. They're looking to all of us for guidance because this world is big and scary. Just ask the moms and dads down at Santa Fe how big and scary it is. We need each other. So I'm going to ask us uh, just to stand together and uh, we're going to pray and we're going to recommit ourselves to the task of leading our young people into wisdom. And we're going to ask God to give us what we need. Will you pray with me, please? Father, thank you so much for giving us the gift of children. We readily confess to you how inadequate we feel to be their parents sometimes. We need you. We need your word. We need your son, Jesus. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need each other. And so, Lord, as one body here called Faith Bridge, we're going to join our hearts this morning and say to you, Lord, we recommit ourselves. We're not going to let this big, scary world overwhelm us because you have overcome the world and we are your people. And so we lift up our hearts to you and we cry out to you and we say, Lord, give us what we need. Give us the wisdom we lack that we might impart it to the young people in our lives. That they may grow to become men and women who know you and who love you and who are living for you. And we offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hey, if you need to pray a little bit more, I'm going to be down here with some of our prayer partners at the front. We'll be glad to pray with you. If you're here for the first time, make your way out to party on the patio. Otherwise, go in peace. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, hello and welcome to Postscript. I'm Kyle Pettit, the young adult pastor here at FaithBridge. I'm sitting here with Pastor Dan, who just preached a message in a new series, Setting Your Kids Up for Success. First one being discipline, Uh, and we have a couple questions in. Okay. Uh, The first one being, what about parents who are no longer married to one another? Any advice on how they can still be a unified front? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, uh, after the first service, Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of people approached me with that. That's tough. Yeah. Uh, In best case scenario, the former spouses are still friends, Mm -hmm. still on friendly terms. Mm -hmm. And so my suggestion there is to to talk Mm -hmm. and come to some agreement. You may not agree on everything, but come to some things that you are going to agree on and then stick with those. In the unfortunate cases where there is no friendship, my suggestion is to the degree that you have influence and authority over your child, Mm -hmm. you be consistent. Mm, You you, you can't control what your ex is going to do. When when they're gone from your place, it's it's out of your hands. But as long as they are with you and under your authority, you be sure that you're Mm -hmm. being consistent and enforcing the same rules and expectations all along. Yeah. Right, that makes sense. That's really good. Well, cool. Well, our second question that we have is, could you explain uh, more the difference between punishment and discipline? Sure. As I mentioned in the sermon, these two terms are often used interchangeably, mm-hmm. but, but they really aren't the same, uh, particularly when it comes to, to child rearing. Mm-hmm. Uh, punishment 
as I said, is very narrow in its focus. It is typically addressing a particular event or right. issue. And the objective is, is simply to get the child to change his or her behavior, you know, right. to be obedient in that moment. There, there may or may not be a lesson learned. Mm -hmm. It may just be, you know what? I'm the boss, so this is happening. <laughs> right. Too bad. On the other hand, when it comes to discipline, uh, it's much broader in the sense that it includes not only occasionally punishment, but mm. also instruction, mm. modeling, uh, helping your child think through mm -hmm. what they've done and the consequences. It, it, it's really more a way of life right. than it is just dealing with issues as they come right. up. And the long-term goal, of course, is to equip your child to think for him or herself. Right. So that as an adult, and no longer with the good fortune of mom and dad's guidance, they can make wise decisions on their own. Right. That's good. Um, well, could you tell us a little bit about, Ken's gonna be finishing off this series. Could you tell us a little bit what he's gonna be preaching on next week? Yeah, so it's the other half to setting our kids up for success. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're imparting wisdom to them. One way you do that is through discipline, and the other way is through discipling them. And mm. Ken will talk to us about how to effectively disciple our children. Right. Okay. Well, Pastor Dan, thank you for this message. Thank you yep. for answering the questions. Uh, and thank you for joining us at Postscript. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.